Good morning, everyone. This is Joanna Lalikas. I work with Cooperative Extension in coordinating the local foods flagship program. I wanted to thank you for uh, attending this webinar today with Becky Bowen. Uh, basic legal structures for local food value chain businesses. <coughs> for those who aren't aware, this is uh, we have funding through Southern SARE for the development of a graduate course on local food systems for extension agents. And there are certain aspects between sessions of that course that we are opening up to the broader extension community, such as this webinar. So we're glad you could be here with us today. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Becky Bowen. She is the program manager for Cultivate NC with the CRD program with Cooperative Extension at NC State. Becky is an attorney licensed in North Dakota and Minnesota and is seeking uh, committee admission in North Carolina. Is that still true, Becky? Um, she, no, I may have officially licensed now in North Carolina. Great. I thought that this might be a little bit dated. So great. North Carolina, Minnesota, and North Carolina. Uh, she has extensive experience providing community development assistance to small towns and grassroots organization efforts, as well as consulting on entrepreneurial and small business development and nonprofit op operations, uh, including strategic planning, marketing, and financing. She also has a background in arts, um, having founded and managed a semi-professional ballet company for nine years. She recently moved back to North Carolina, her home, home state. Um, and in North Carolina, she co-founded Carolina Common Enterprise, which is a nonprofit development center which specializes in cooperative and community development. In July 2013, she became the program manager of Cultivate NC at NC State University. So Becky, with that, thank you for being here with us today to share your knowledge on basic legal structures. I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Joanna. Um, and welcome, everyone. You know, I thought that when I moved to North Carolina, I would get away from having to teach on very dry topics concerning the law, but it seems to follow me wherever I go. So I'm going to attempt with this presentation to make it as entertaining as possible. So um, I hope you enjoy some of the images that I've included to illustrate various points. So. I'd like to begin with this graphic that most of you should already be familiar with. In looking at this picture of the food system, you can see a number of business development opportunities. If, for example, you start with the food production element, you're, you're talking about a farm or a ranch, which can range in size from as small as a few acres to thousands of acres. And this farm could be operated either by a family or by a company that employs hundreds of workers. Going on to the distribution and aggregation element, we're talking about a CSA or a small food hub to a national company like Cisco Foods. And moving on to the food processing element, it can vary from a, a, a small licensed kitchen for homemade jams and jellies or it could go as big as a factory with automated equipment filling millions of bottles of hot sauce. So I could go on and on about the various job creation and business creation opportunities within the food system, but I think you get my drift. Regional food systems have the ability to generate a multitude of new businesses. And so what we're going to look at now is what are the different types of legal structures that will accommodate these new business startups. So as an attorney, of course, I have to make some legal disclaimers. And my, my first one is that the images that are used in this presentation are not my property. They're not the property of North Carolina State University or the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service. They were all pulled from the internet. And I want to thank Charles M. Schultz in particular for his contribution to this presentation. My second legal disclaimer is that this presentation does not constitute legal advice. So whenever you form a new business entity, you should always consult an attorney. And I actually advise people that they need to consult an accountant as well, because not all attorneys are tax attorneys. So let's get started. You 
are a super local food entrepreneur and you've decided that you want to change the world by starting a business within the local food value chain. You've done all your homework, you think, and you may not have written up a business plan yet, but you're confident you've answered all of the questions you need to and you have all of the skills you need to run this business. You figured out what equipment you need, you found a place that you're going to operate out of, You've got some ideas as to, how to, as to how much money it will cost to start the business, and you have a good idea as to how much it will cost to run the business. Those are two very separate items. You may even have some friends who are willing to work at your business for free, at least for a while. So as far as you're concerned, you're ready to move forward, except for a couple of things. Before you hit the start button, you need to ask yourself, do I have the money that I need? Am I willing to give up some of the control of the business to others? What happens if I want to leave the business? And does everyone involved have common goals? How you answer these four questions, as well as a few others, will help you determine what choice of legal structure you need for your startup business. And while you think you may have, while you may think that you have unlimited skills and powers, it's important to keep in mind that you really are only human and maybe you could use some help. Or you might just end up looking like this. So this is a representation of most of the choices of legal structures out there. And that's you there in the middle scratching your head about which structure is right for you. Should you be a sole proprietor, a partnership, an LLC, a nonprofit, a cooperative? And maybe you've heard of an S corporation, but what the heck is a C corporation? You also may, heard, may have heard of the B corp, but are, are uncertain if it will work for you. Finally, you've heard of LLPs and PCs and even L3Cs but really have no clue for why they exist and if they are even a choice for you. So, if you are Richie Rich and money is no object, when making a choice of legal structure, the primary things that most attorneys will ask you to consider are the first six on this list. So they are ease of formation, external liability, taxation, management and control, transferability, and continuity. I like to think of myself as a social entrepreneur, and so I tend to ask a seventh question, and that is, what is your mission? Now, that sounds relatively easy, um, an easy thing to answer, and you should have already determined what your mission is before you've gotten to the point of creating a legal structure. But let's take a moment to examine each of these concepts now. Okay, ease of formation. Ease of formation means how easy is it to form each of these legal structures. Now, for purposes of this presentation and at this point in the presentation, I'm only going to focus on the five major structures which are listed on the slide. And as you might expect, it is easiest to form a sole proprietorship, and very generally speaking, the hardest to form is a cooperative. However, the ease of formation is in large part due to the number of owners you are dealing with. So the number of people who have expressed an ownership interest in your business will in large part determine which of these structures you pick. So a cooperative, especially a consumer cooperative, could have thousands of members, just as a publicly traded corporation may have thousands of shareholders. Ease of formation also means how many internal governance documents need to, prepared, need to be prepared and agreed to. A sole proprietorship will have no documents like that. But as, if you, as you move down this list of structures, there will be a greater need for legal agreements, as well as, in some cases, 
filings with the state and sometimes federal agencies. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that depending on the stage of maturity your company is, and this is very important, you may consider converting from one form of legal structure to another at a later time. So you may, in fact, start as a sole proprietorship, move into a partnership or an LLC, and then ultimately move into a corporate structure. So in other words, your legal structure is not written in stone. It's written on paper. And that means that you generally, and I mean generally, there are exceptions, of course, Generally, you can rewrite your structure at another time if it outgrows its usefulness. Okay, so the first concept that we have to deal with, with is external liability. External liability means that you, as the owner of a business, are personally responsible for the repayment of all of the business debt or the payment of all damages or other liabilities arising out of your business's operation. As a sole proprietor, you are not protected against the possibility of losing your house, all the money in your personal banking account, or any of your other personal act assets for any activities of your businesses. Now again, for purposes of this presentation, I am ignoring the protections that are provided through bankruptcy laws. Okay, so for example, if you own your farm as a sole proprietorship and had to borrow money from a bank to fund your farming operations and then your crop doesn't come in and you don't have crop insurance to pay back the loan and have no other money to pay that loan back, you could theoretically lose your home. We'll get into how sole proprietors do protect themselves, but for purposes of this slide, it is important to point out how external liability is an important consideration when choosing a legal structure for your food business. The least protection is when you are organized as a sole proprietorship. The greatest protection is when you're organized as an LLC corporation or cooperative. The second element to consider when choosing a legal structure is how you want your business and yourself to be taxed on your business's income. A sole proprietorship, partnership, and the S Corp have what is called pass-through taxation. That means that the business itself is not taxed as a separate legal entity. All business profits are passed through to you according to your ownership interests and taxed at your individual rate. The LLC and the cooperative allow for their owners to elect pass-through tax taxation. The for-profit C Corp uh, is taxed at the corporate level on its profits and its shareholders are then taxed on the amount of their dividends. This is, this is what is known as double taxation. So a dollar earned by the corporation is taxed at the corporate level, and then again, when that dollar is passed through to the shareholders as a dividend, it is taxed again. So it is, that dollar is taxed twice. The nonprofit corporation, if it is a 501A exempt organization, will not pay taxes on its revenue, which is generally grants and donations. But it may be taxed on its unrelated business income, which is that income that is generated through activities not directly associated with its social mission. The fourth element to consider when choosing a legal structure is how much control you as an owner want to have of your business's operations. Obviously, with the sole proprietorship, you as the owner will have the most decision-making authority of all of the basic legal structures. In a partnership, you will share that management responsibility with your partners. Although, when we get to the partnership slide, you will see that not all partnerships are alike. In an LLC, your operating agreement will designate the managing members. In a cooperative, the members will elect a board of directors to hire managing staff. 
And in a corporation, the shareholders will similarly elect a board of directors to hire a managing staff. I actually ranked the cooperative higher than the corporation in terms of owner management and control because in a cooperative, every member is treated equally and holds no more than one share of stock, whereas in a corporation, not every shareholder is equal. Whoever owns the most shares in a corporation has the most ability to control decision making. So in a corporation, money rules. The fifth element of choosing a legal structure is this concept of transferability. Now, what that means is how easy is it to transfer an ownership interest and get out of the business. So speaking in very general terms, the corporation, and in particular, the publicly traded C corporation, is the structure by which ownership interests can be relatively quickly sold or otherwise transferred. As companies grow, they require more capital, and the corporate structure accommodates quick infusions of capital through stock offerings and splits. As we move through the other structures, the ability to quickly raise capital by selling ownership interests becomes less efficient, or maybe a better way to say it is more intimate. The publicly traded corporate model has the stock market as a global vehicle for buying and selling stock to literally everyone and anyone. A cooperative, on the other hand, can only sell ownership interests to its members. And a similar arrangement is typical in a partnership and an LLC. Finally, transferring an interest in a sole proprietorship means selling the entire business, lock, stock, and barrel. That means that a buyer may be more difficult to find because you are selling off a business rather than just a share or other ownership interest. The next element, which I believe we're on the sixth element of determining well, what your legal structure to be, is this concept of continuity. Continuity refers to the ability of a business to exist for an unlimited period of time. So corporations, cooperatives, and now in some states, LLCs, can state in their articles or organizing documents that they have perpetual existence. Because of their more intimate nature, partnerships and sole proprietorships do not exist in perpetuity. Partnerships typically have buy-sell provisions in their partnership agreement, which specifies what happens upon a partner's death or departure. The sole proprietor, on the other hand, must take the continuation of his business into consideration through succession and estate planning. Okay, so now we're getting to the seventh element, which is something that I um, really focus on when advising clients. So that is mission. And most educational materials that you read do not list the identification of mission as one of the basic elements of determining a business's legal structure. But I think it is very important that a company's mission be clearly identified by all organizing parties before the legal structure is chosen. And I say this because there are different types of owners making their investment choices for different reasons. So first, there are people who are interested in just making money. These are your typical investors in a C Corp, for example, who are most interested in making their extra cash grow by investing and are in a moderate to high growth company. They may be less interested in what the company does and more interested in how much money it will make for them. The traditional corporate structure is all about making money for the shareholders. In fact, if it doesn't make money for them, it runs the risk of having some very unhappy shareholders either selling their shares and thus devaluating the business or at worst, initiating a shareholder derivative lawsuit. The second type of investor are those people who are interested in filling an individual need that the market economy is not meeting. 
These are people who may join a cooperative. Food cooperatives, for example, are formed by a community of people who are not happy with their food choices at their local grocery store or who may not have access to a grocery store. The third type of investor are people who want to be involved with a company because they perceive it as contributing to the greater good. This last type of person would want to donate to a nonprofit, for example. They typically have a more charitable nature than your um, corporate investor, and they may not only get a deduction on their taxes, but also feel good about supporting a worthy cause. At this point, I also want to throw in, just mention, the B Corp and the L3C. Um, I'll get into them a little bit more later, but they are recent models of a legal structure, a for-profit legal structure, that is created by state statute. And these structures are attempting to, to blend investment opportunities for those people who are interested in making money but are willing to take a lower return because they are also supporting the triple bottom line goal of profit, people, and planet. So returns from a B Corp and an L3C are typically low to very low and actually would lend themselves very well to the development of the food system but I'll get into why we can't use those in North Carolina in a little bit. Okay, so now that we've gone through all of the questions that need to be answered before choosing your legal structure, let's get down to the real question that confronts all super local food entrepreneurs, and that is money. How much is needed and where will it come from? It's unfortunate that money is such a big factor in getting things done in this world, but it is. And the funny thing is, is that when I provide advice on developing business structures, I often tell my clients not to worry about the money. I tell them to focus first on a feasibility study, then on a business plan, and if you have both of those things right, the money will in many cases follow. And I truly believe that. That advice, however, is especially good if you are richy rich and you have money. But let's face it, you are not richy rich. You, the extension agent, actually look a little bit more like Pigpen, especially in your frazzled state of mind about how you're going to get a um, local food business venture off the ground. And as an extension agent, you need to walk a straight and narrow line, as many of you may have heard in yesterday's presentation, with respect to your participation in this food-related venture. So coming from extension, a service organization with an educational mission, you may think that a nonprofit venture is the best way to go. There are, after all, a lot of great government grants and foundations out there just dying to give you some money to help you develop your local food system, right? Well, let's look at those nonprofit corporations. The advantage of a nonprofit corporation is that it is very attractive to corporate donors and foundations. It's great for bootstrapping, which all of us are doing when we're starting up a business from scratch. It may be tax exempt, most likely in order for it to get um, grants, it will need to be tax exempt. And it may or may not be member based. The disadvantages of nonprofit corporation is that any profits that it may enjoy are not distributed to owners because nonprofit corporations are not owned by any individual or corporate interest. These profits have to be reinvested in whatever the nonprofit social mission is. And upon dissolution of a nonprofit, all assets must be transferred to another nonprofit. The other risk is you may risk losing your exempt status due to, un to, due to excessive unrelated business income. So keep in mind that nonprofits have a social, not a commercial, mission. They must be established for charitable, public, or religious purposes or for mutual benefit. 
Mutual benefit doesn't necessarily mean just the benefit of its members. Rather, there needs to be a service or benefit to the public. Selling fruits and vegetables to the public and taking that sales revenue to serve a social mission like feeding the hungry would be an example of a nonprofit mission. Selling fruits and vegetables to the public then taking the sales revenue and distributing it back to the producers is not a social mission. And if that is all the nonprofit is doing, it may get in trouble with the IRS and lose its nonprofit classification. The other big concern with choosing nonprofit status is, and this is really the practical concern, is your grant sources may dry up or lose their leads, as the slide above illustrates. Whoops, I am missing a slide. Well, here we go. Now, don't get me wrong, nonprofits can be a way to get things started because of the philanthropy of foundations and the government and who really want to help you fulfill your mission. However, being an enterprise lodged in the local food value chain more likely means you are trying to make some money for yourself, not necessarily for the public good. Consequently, you need to look at other types of legal structures to house your business. So the sole proprietorship is the most popular form of legal structure and accounts for more than 76% of all businesses in the U.S. It's the easiest and cheapest to form. If it's just you who wants to go into business, say a farm or a restaurant, this may be the one way you want to go, but it has its disadvantages as well, including unlimited personal liability which means your home, your bank account, and all of your personal assets are at risk if your business goes belly up. More difficulty getting a loan because it's dependent on your personal financial statement. And remember, you are picked in, not Richie Rich. And what happens when you want to retire? On the other hand, you have full control over your business's future. You pay all the bills, make all the money, and just because you are the owner of your business doesn't mean that you can't have employees. You can have employees, but understand that you are personally responsible for workers' comp and payroll taxes. So make sure you have the money to cover them before you hire anyone. If you find that you are not able to handle all of the responsibility and capital needs of a new business, you might want to consider to bringing in more people to your venture. So that brings us to a partnership structure. Partnerships draw on the skills, knowledge, and financial resources of more than one person, provide greater leverage when seeking loans, and each partner pays taxes and receives income based on their proportionate interest in the partnership. There are also different kinds of partnerships, including general partnerships, limited partnerships, and limited liability limited partnerships. The partnership structure has been morphing over decades to address one of Richie Rich's questions. That is, who bears the risk of personal liability if the business goes belly up? In a general partnership, all partners bear full responsibility for the debts of the partnership, even those created by a partner other than yourself. That means you have to have a lot of trust when you pick your general partners. In a limited partnership, one person is designated the general partner and therefore has full personal liability. He will bear all of the risk of running that business, meaning he could lose his house, while the limited partners are only responsible up to the amount of their investment. So the partnership structure may be ideal for smaller ventures with only a few people, but again, there are some disadvantages. Partnership agreements must be carefully crafted so the partnership doesn't dissolve upon the death of a partner or when he leaves the business. There therefore needs to be a buy-sell provision in the partnership agreement that addresses who is entitled to buy that partner's shares, when, what events trigger a buyout, and what is the price to be paid for the partner's interest. In addition, key person life insurance should be purchased on general partners to allow for the buyout or otherwise keep the business going after their departure. The next legal structure to consider is the corporation. The corporation is generally um, a good idea when you want to uh, grow your business and you need extra capital. 
Um, I thought that this slide, besides being cute, illustrates an important point. Corporations are legal structures that are considered separate legal entities. They are owned by people. Um, I'm sorry. Corporations are legal structures that are considered separate legal entities, and that's why the sign says that they are people. They obviously are not people, but they are owned by people, and they have the ability to own property, sue, and be sued. The corporation is considered a separate legal entity also because it is taxed separately. I mentioned to you already this concept of double taxation, which means that at a corporate level, revenues are taxed, and then any dividends paid to the shareholders are also taxed. So the same dollar of revenue is taxed twice. The advantage of the corporation is that the corporate structure provides what is called the corporate shield. This means that directors, officers, and shareholders are typically not responsible for debts of the corporation or other corporate liabilities except to the amount of their investment. In other words, if you are a shareholder of a tobacco company when it is sued for a billion dollars, you won't lose your house and all of your other worldly possessions. You will, however, notice a significant decline in the value of your shares. I also want to put out there that I don't personally think that corporations generally are evil. It's just that because of their structure, they, particularly publicly traded corporations, can be distant from their owners, the shareholders. The shareholders elect the board of directors who is responsible for hiring management who then hires the workers. This arrangement allows for a lot of passive investing and a vehicle for raising a lot of money. So for a capital-intensive venture, the C-Corp may be the way to go. The S-Corp is a type of corporation. Um, however, it, it varies a little bit and has kind of limited usage. Um, it's historically been an important legal structure for smaller businesses. It provides the corporate shield, but it is limited in terms of the number of investors. So we're going to look now at the advantages and disadvantages of the C-Corps and the S-Corps. So the C-Corp, the advantages are limited liability for owners, the shareholders, the ability to raise major capital through the sale of stock, and tra easy transferability of ownership interest through the sale of shares. The disadvantages of corporate structure is they are more complex and expensive to form there is more governmental regulation. There is no pass-through of losses to shareholders. There is double taxation. And control resides in the board of directors, not in the shareholders. S-corps have pass-through taxation, limited liability. But they are limited to only 100 shareholders, all of whom must be US citizens. It's not desirable if wanting to expand, and it has a limited ability to own subsidiary corporations. The S-Corp would be an ideal structure for um, local food business startups. It could be, um, but it's not as flexible as the LLC. And we're going to get into the LLC in just a minute. When I made this presentation, um, at the end of March, I gave a very abbreviated preview of this presentation. And Joanna asked me about the B Corp. So I'm going to tell you what the B Corp is, but I'm also pointing out that it is not a structure that is currently available in North Carolina. In fact, it has been um, proposed twice and defeated twice in the General Assembly. So a B Corp is a benefit corporation, which is a type of for-profit corporation. Um, it has passed in 28 states, but it has been unsuccessful in North Carolina. It is a for-profit venture which seeks to achieve a triple bottom line with its positive impact on society and the environment in addition to profit. B Corps differ from traditional C Corps and S Corps in purpose, accountability, and transparency. But it is the same with respect to taxation. So it is taxed twice. 
Um, there are B Corps operating in other states. Many of them have what is called the B Lab certification, which is kind of like a lead certification for triple bottom line enterprises. Um, a benefit or a B corporation's directors and officers operate the business with the same authority as in a traditional C corp, but they are required to consider the impact of their decisions not only on shareholders, but also on society and the environment. In a traditional corporation, shareholders judge the comp company's financial performance with the B corp. Shareholders judge performance based on how a corporation's goals benefit society and the environment. So it sounds like a really good model for food system development, but again, it's not allowed in North Carolina. So enter the LLC. This is a major and favorite type of legal structure for attorneys. LLC stands for Limited Liability Company. It is the superstructure of legal structures. And like the corporation, the LLC provides a corporate shield to personal liability, but like the S Corp, can allow for pass-through taxation. Its size can range in number from one member to literally thousands because it has no maximum size. So in a sense, it's a cross between a partnership in that how assets and liabilities are allocated are spelled out in an agreement, and a corporation because of the limited liability protection it offers. The LLC is very flexible, which is what makes it such a popular choice among attorneys. However, it doesn't lend itself particularly well to investments from a large number of people despite the fact that membership is unlimited, because of the requirement that members also have the right to manage the LLC. It also has relatively expensive formation requirements and requires the preparation of an operating agreement where rights and duties are spelled out for its members. So it's a lawyer intensive structure. So the advantages listed here for limited liability companies are pass-through taxation to its members, limited liability, perpetual existence, centralized management, free transferability, unlimited number of members, it may own subsidiary corporations, and it may have multiple classes of stock. The disadvantages, it may be more expensive to form, it is not considered a separate entity, Members must file quarterly estimated taxes, and um, this is always a risk with um, legal structures that have multiple members. But you may be required to register, to, to register it with the Security and Exchange Commission if the members don't manage it. So typically with LLCs, you see a rather small number of members. Um, so that you don't have to register it with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is a very expensive and legal intense process. The final disadvantage to a limited liability company, which will be a similar disadvantage for a cooperative, is that consensus may be difficult. Okay, I'm going to um, take a, just a minute to talk about the L3C and this concept of fourth sector enterprises. So the L3C stands for the Low Profit Limited Liability Company. This was an option in North Carolina until last year when it was repealed. The L3C was an LLC with that triple bottom line twist that the B Corporation addresses. It was hoped that the L3C could become an investment vehicle for program-related investments of private foundations. Typically, a private foundation gives grants to nonprofits, but what the L3C was attempting to do is create a vehicle for private foundations to actually make low-return investments, so not a charitable investment, but an actual investment with a small return. So it, the L3C provided a way for investors to support social enterprise, which in, in many respects food system development is, 
that was not strictly nonprofit in nature. Like I said, the L3C was done away with in 2014 in North Carolina because it was said to be an unnecessary legal structure. Now, L3Cs have been controversial, promoted by some as a way to increase the flow of capital to socially beneficial enterprises, but criticized by others as a flawed type of LLC that doesn't achieve its goals. The L3C, along with the other types of businesses that are shown in this graphic here, are what are called fourth sector enterprises. Your sustainable enterprises, mission-driven businesses, worker-owned businesses, civic enterprises, municipal enterprises, cooperatives, faith-based enterprises, hybrids, nonprofits, and community development corporations all fall in the center. If they're not public sector enterprises, they're not private sector enterprises. In many cases, they are a social sector enterprise, but they are in the middle, the intersection of the three other sectors. And so that's why they are called fourth sector enterprises. And they lend themselves very well to food system enterprise development. So the final legal structure that I'm covering today is the cooperative. Um, it is, for most attorneys, the least known legal structure out there. Um, it offers limited liability like a corporation and like the LLC and the S Corp allow its mem their members to elect pass-through taxation. It is most akin to the LLC, however, it does have its differences. And chief among those differences is the notion of one share, one vote. In other words, money doesn't influence decision making so much as people do. Each member is entitled to only one share and every share is valued the same. So membership interests and cooperatives are also exempted from securities laws, which is a real plus. The advantage and disadvantage of the cooperative structure is you may be working with a lot of divergent competing interests. And that's why it is so important that everyone who is involved in the organization of your business be on the same path and have a common vision for what the organization is going to be. In addition, because there are so many legalities associated with cooperative formation, you should be sure to hire a cooperative specialist who is familiar with those legal nuances. So the advantages of cooperatives, pass through taxation, technical assistance providers are generally funded through um, USDA rural development. Um, there are reduced costs and improved bargaining power due to a high number of members in the cooperatives. It has perpetual existence and it is a democratic organization. Now the disadvantages. Cooperatives may suffer from slower cash flow than a typical corporation since a member's incentive to contribute depends on how much he or she wants to use the cooperative services and products. While a one member, one share, one vote philosophy is appealing to small investors, larger investors may choose to invest their money elsewhere because a larger share investment in a cooperative does not translate to greater decision making power. In addition, choosing the right price for a cooperative share is tricky. If the share is priced too low, it will require more members to launch the cooperative. If it is priced too high, it may result in not serving the needs of its community. So in order for a cooperative to be successful, it must be true to its community needs. Finally, if members do not fully participate and perform their duties, many cooperatives have a mandatory labor requirement, then the business cannot operate at full capacity. Now, we don't have time to look at this webinar, but I really encourage all of you to take an hour and a half, it is a good hour and a half, but this is a fabulous webinar called The Role of Cooperatives in local food system development. It, um, it's the best webinar I have ever seen on how, how excellent a <laughs> legal structure of the cooperative is throughout the food system, from producer co-ops to um, 
worker co-ops to consumer-owned co-ops now providing the market for food businesses um, to a multi-stakeholder hybrid cooperative that combines the producer, the worker, and the consumer all into one business. Um, this webinar has a lot of evidence uh, showing that the cooperative is the most viable legal structure for food hubs. This has been shown um, in a study that covers the entire country. So I really encourage you to uh, take a look at this webinar. So in conclusion, when picking a legal structure, always consult with an attorney. There are a myriad of choices out there, and it's important to pick the right one for the person or people that you are working with. Now, I want you to take a close look at this slide. Remember in some of the earlier slides, I said that you looked more like Pigpen? If you look at this picture, you'll notice that Pigpen isn't there. That means that you, the extension agent, may have had a hand in catalyzing the business, but its real heroes are everybody else. And that concludes my presentation. I do have a few references. Um, and then here's my contact information. I am, I live in Winston-Salem and for the most part work out of a home office, so I'm very available for any of you in the West who might have some additional questions about legal structures. And then I come to Raleigh on a very regular basis, so can also make arrangements to meet with people in the East. So thank you, and let's uh, let's open it up. Great, for thank you so much, Becky. That was very informative um, and very well done. So I want to uh, ask the folks on the webinar: Do you all have any questions? I don't see any in the chat bar, but you may also raise your hand and ask Becky um, by turning on your microphone. Yes, Dara. Oh, that's a quick question. Becky, did you just did you say right at the end there that you think that cooperatives are the best legal structure for food hubs? And if so, can you just um, maybe expand on that a little bit and explain why specifically food hubs are a good fit for a cooperative legal structure? Food hubs are a good fit for a cooperative legal structure? Well, that is the study that uh, one of the presentations in that webinar, there was a, a national study conducted by USDA that um, surveyed all of the existing food hubs. The majority of the food hubs are privately owned. Um, I, think, I think that the second highest number of food hubs are, are cooperatively owned and then the nonprofit and then some government owned ones as well. And what they found was that with the cooperative structure, um, they actually had the longevity um, of all of the food hubs that are out there. They were the ones that had been around the longest, and they had um, better returns um, to the um, cooperative members. So um, based on that, USDA is really pushing this um, cooperative structure as being the ideal or the best structure for food hub development. And personally, I do do co-op development. And I will say, you know, I take a firm stance with, um, I really believe it's important that the producers themselves have skin in the game. And that is the structure that allows for them to put some money in and realize that the food hub is just not another outlet for them, but it's an actual business that they have an interest in. And in order for that business to succeed, they have to provide product or whatever else it is that they're using the food hub for. Does That's that perfect. Your Thank question? you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. So we do have a question here. With double taxation corporations, are they taxed at a lower rate since they are taxed twice at the corporate level and the investor level? Well, you know, the investor level, how much they are taxed will depend on, you know, what their income is. Um, at the corporate level, you know, there is a corporate tax rate, and that will vary from uh, state to state. And then, of course, there is a federal corporate tax rate. Um, that could be why that uh, corporations are taxed at a lower amount. 
um, than individual taxes, but um, I haven't gotten into the reasoning why I just know that it is. <laughs> they are taxed, that that dollar is taxed twice. Great, thanks. Thanks for that question, Deborah. Uh, other folks, any questions? Feel free to type in the, in the chat bar or raise your hand. While we're waiting, Becky, I thought I would ask, um, with your comments about um, the importance of mission and how that's important to define before choosing a business legal structure, if you could bullet point kind of two or three reasons for that, how would you summarize that? Well, I, I'm just looking from my own personal experience working with some groups who are interested in starting a food hub in lower income communities. And there is a there is a group that is very interested in having organics and natural foods um, in in the store. And then there is another group that is interested in just having a store that has very low prices. And how they, uh, the organizing group has to come to terms with who their target market is. Um, and when I say market, who their investors are going to be. Are they going to appeal to the people who want natural and organic? Or do they want to appeal to um, folks who are more interested in um, food access issues? So. That's why I say it's it's very important that you really determine you know, what it is that is driving you, and that will then determine who your investors are going to be. Great, thank you. Okay, it looks like we have no other questions. Like Becky, will we be able to make this PowerPoint available uh, via the local foods oh, web sure. portal or otherwise? Uh, absolutely. Um, I'll just send it to you, and um, and then you can put it up. And it will also be available in the um, community development portal. Well, great. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a good day.